So I have so, a question about sin and maybe Catholicism, because if a sinner in Catholicism goes to his priest and says, you know, I have sinned, and they, he's told to do five Hail Marys or whatever they're told, and so now their sin has gone. Well, has it gone? Or is it in their mind that it's gone? I mean, where does karma play a role with, with that type of religion? Well, I think, I think we can look at surrender and for, uh, asking forgiveness, which is actually one of the steps on, in 12 Steps that we were just talking about a while yes. ago. It's making amends for those we have harmed, the harm we have done. I think if, if one approaches that sincerely, um, whether it's in the structure of the confession booth or whether it's just in daily life, if one approaches the, the act of uh, seeking forgiveness and making amends, that is a spiritual technique. And I think uh, it's saying that that wipes out all your sins is obviously an exaggeration, but uh, as a spiritual technique, making amends is is a practice that has an effect in reducing the, uh, the amount of uh, obstructions and impurities in our nervous system. And I guess everybody even... ev- everybody has experienced that sense of openness when they feel that they've been forgiven, right? Yes, and and I think having even the sense of remorse is a good thing. If it leads to, uh, yeah, if it leads to an opening, yes. I, I would not recommend it as a lifetime. No. <laughs> uh, you know, with the whip, uh, yes. the monks who whip themselves. Oh, and, uh, gosh, you know, I don't yes. think that's that's a particularly good uh, spiritual practice. It doesn't feel very Although, healthy, hey, does it? <laughs> whatever works, you know. But the thing is, you don't want to be stuck in one fixed mode of, uh, your relationship with your chosen ideal, because if, if you're not growing and you're not evolving, I think that is the strongest sign that we can that we can see that we should take a closer look at our practices and what, what we're doing about our spiritual progress. Mm-hmm. Now, so we're, you know, some people extend this idea of being God fearing and karma fearing and sin to uh, <coughs> excuse me to it being a lifetime sentence. And that uh, the only peace we're going to find is in the hereafter. Um, You know, I would take issue with that. I think that uh, if there is heaven, we're going to find it here on earth just as quickly as we're going to experience it after this life. Absolutely. I think if there is a heaven that's outside of this earth, the only time I think the only chance we're going to have of experiencing it is if we can create it here first. Absolutely. Mm. We really can't know for sure um, where we will be down the road, and we honestly shouldn't be laboring over it. What we should be doing is uh, Creating it. everything we can today. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it sort of reminds me of an old an old prayer. Um, you know, oh God, if there is a God, please save my soul if I have a soul. <laughs> 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 so we... What we know is that we're here and now and that we have these means um, that do change our experience of life and can bring us happiness in life and more peace and creativity and improve relationships. And I think that's really where it all should start. And, and it all can go from there all the way. When, when we can find no other reason for a disaster... We say it must be karma if if there's been a hurricane and there's been a village wiped out and it must be karma. But how does karma and the, and cause and effect really work in life under those types of situations? Do you think? That's a very complex one. Obviously, uh, there really is no way to explain or put behind us the loss of of, of loved ones. Um, or of many people in a natural disaster. And I think that karma is used conceptually to explain some of these things that are really not explainable. Mm. Um, And karma is not a suitable explanation for anyone, really, who has experienced a terrible loss like that, uh, or for a country, or for a city, or a community. But it's built into the culture, you know. We have to go on. So I think it has a certain 
a sort of an intellectual practical value. But more importantly, I think I think beneath that we see ourselves as spiritual evolving beings and, and we can continue on and as we do and we become more open and have more inner silence and more ability to see things um, how should we say the immortal aspect of life we see it as the temporary thing that it is uh, let's face it if someone dies in an accident um, the only difference between that person and us is that their mortality is expressing now and ours will surely express later <laughs> and maybe sooner rather than later we, we're all we're all mortal and so I think this raises the bigger question of what is life and what is mortality and uh, how can we change our relationship to it in a way that will enable us to be at peace and without fear um, and once we have moved along that path with practices like meditation and so on we see disasters from a different place and that actually makes us more able to function in the face of them. You know, when life is falling apart in front of us, the person who's a meditator is going to be much better able to deal with it than the person who sees it as this is the end of everything, you know? When, yes, when I, when I look at the Tibetan monks and the violence that they've put up with, with the Chinese soldiers and being thrown out and murdered and beaten up and... And here are these beings who are apparently in bhakti, have a, a very strong, powerful spiritual path. I don't understand the karma there. I don't understand what's happened. Well, karma, they say, is unfathomable. And uh, that is certainly true. But what, what isn't unfathomable is our ability to transcend it and transform it. And in the case of the Tibetans, their karma, which one might uh, label as bad, actually has turned out to be a great blessing for the world. Because yeah. if it were yeah. not for the Tibetan situation, which no one would wish upon them, yeah. but if it were not for that, we would not have Tibetan Buddhism spread all over the world the way we, the way we do today. And yes. that has been a, a wonderful gift to humankind. Yes, it's true. So... You know, I don't know how uh, a Tibetan might feel about that, particularly one, just a peasant who had to run <laughs> for their life and now lives in India or somewhere, maybe the United States or somewhere else. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that culture is advanced enough to where you feel that. You feel that. You know, I've been to Tibetan events in the past and cultural events where they come and do their thing and you sense a peace in these people mm -hmm. that's quite uh, quite deep and stabilizing and that's really what counts yes uh, nobody wants to lose their country um, but the fact is it can happen but you can't lose your spirituality once you have it no matter what happens so that's a pretty good demonstration of how important it is to put your spirituality at the top of your list. Yes. now Because everything else is going to go. <laughs> yes, absolutely. What can we do about the, the consequence aspect of our karma and how can we change the effects to be positive in our life? Meditate. And in time the stillness that we cultivate in meditation and, and additional practices will begin to move uh, from within us and flow out around us. And that will transform the consequences of our karma. Um, it most definitely will.